Hello, I'm Bill DiGiuseppe, a principal hydrogeologist with Jacobs. Welcome to the Interstate Technology and Regulatory Council's series on per- and polyfluoroalkyl substances. This presentation will cover conventional and innovative treatment technologies for PFAS-impacted liquids and soils. The purpose of this video is to briefly summarize treatment technologies and introduce information that is detailed in the ITRC documents, which can be found at the web address shown. We will be getting a quick overview of several technologies. This is not meant to provide information on remediation design, but to provide some basic information to understand treatment options for a given site. In this video, we will cover liquids and solids technologies that are commercially available and well-developed. Key features, advantages, and disadvantages, and limitations will be briefly summarized for each technology. Additionally, we will briefly cover technologies that are in development now and may be available in the future. The listener can get substantially more information from the ITRC guidance documents, which includes detailed technology descriptions, tables of innovative technologies with references, and case studies with engineering data. The ITRC remediation subgroup divided up all the technologies into three categories. Field implemented technologies, which are those well documented at multiple locations by multiple practitioners and generally well represented in peer reviewed literature. Limited application, which are those that have been field implemented but only by a handful of practitioners or a handful of sites and are generally not well documented, sometimes only in vendor literature. And developing technologies, which are those that have only been demonstrated in the lab at bench scale uh, by typically only one group or have not been well documented or validated by others. Destructive and in situ technologies are generally in the limited application and developing category for now. Over time, it's expected that technologies will progress from the developing category into the limited category as they head into the field and from the limited category into the fully developed category um, as they have more documentation of their effectiveness. So these distinctions can be fluid over time. I'll first review liquid technologies, then soil. The first well-developed technology for liquids is sorption to granular activated carbon, or GAC, which is typically applied ex situ or above ground. The hydrophobic tail sorbs to the carbon, removing it from the water stream. Performance is affected by site-specific water quality, including geochemical conditions and co-contaminants, as well as the source of the carbon, the manufacturing process, and enhancements. Carbon based on bituminous sources, that is coal, has been demonstrated in many cases to be more effective than carbon based on coconut shells. But site-specific testing is required to properly assess the options for your site. As the graph shows, short chain compounds break through sooner than longer chain compounds, where PFBA, perfluorobutanoic acid, breaks through way earlier than other PFAS. Carboxylates, such as PFBA or PFHXA, tend to break through faster than sulfonates, such as PFOS or PFHXS. Questions have been raised about the use of reactivated carbon for drinking water, but reactivation has been demonstrated to fully remove PFAS from the carbon. Additionally, for drinking water applications, the National Sanitation Foundation requires reactivated carbon to be returned to your site rather than commingling carbon from multiple sites. Sorption to ion exchange resin is the next most widely used ex situ PFAS treatment technology. Ion exchange media are particularly effective because they capitalize on both the adsorption of the hydrophobic tail, similar to carbon, as well as the ion exchange capacity of the anionic hydrophilic head, which is the sulfonate or carboxylate functional group. Carbon and ion exchange can be used in series using two or more vessels, with ion exchange typically being after the carbon to minimize mass loading and extend the bed life of the generally more expensive ion exchange resin. This allows effluent concentrations to remain low or non-detect even after partial breakthrough of the carbon by specific PFAS. Ion exchange resins are selective for anions and sometimes for PFAS specifically, making them highly efficient per volume of media. Empty bed contact times for resin are typically in the range of two to three minutes versus for carbon, which is 10 to 15 minutes. This allows a much smaller treatment vessel for the ion exchange media. And overall, that requires a smaller footprint for the system. So if any buildings are being built or other things, the costs are much lower in that respect as well. 
Ion exchange media are susceptible to blinding from co-contaminants or water that is high in to total dissolved solids or other geochemical interferences. The practitioner must use care when assessing life cycle costs between carbon and ion exchange media using a cost per volume of water treated as opposed to a cost per pound of media uh, before breakthrough. Site-specific testing is critical because each option could be preferred at a given site. There are two kinds of ion exchange media resins, uh, single-use and regenerable. Single-use ion exchange resins are pretty simple and straightforward in terms of design and operation. Sorption varies with uh, carboxylates typically breaking through earlier than sulfonates, as can be seen in this graph, where PFHXA starts breaking through after 50,000 bed volumes, but PFOS has still not broken through after 350,000 bed volumes. So depending on what parameters are being monitored and regulated, uh, it could have a very long bed life with ion exchange media, especially at the low concentrations typically found. Spent resins need to be disposed, typically by incineration or landfilling. A second application of ion exchange resin is regenerable systems, where the resin is flushed on site with a solvent and salt brine to remove PFAS from the resin and concentrate it in the regenerant solution. The solvent is recovered, leaving only a low volume, high concentration brine, which is then treated with carbon or sorbed onto a small amount of resin and shipped off site for incineration or disposal. Several full-scale systems are operating in the field in Australia and the US. The regenerant solution could one day be destroyed on site by one of the destructive technologies that are developing, which I'll discuss later. Reverse osmosis and other membrane filtration separation methods are widely used for VOCs and other impurities, especially for high purity water applications like drinking water treatment. RO has been demonstrated to be effective for a wide range of PFAS, but is a high energy method and the reject water, which represents one-tenth to one-quarter of the flow, requires additional treatment or disposal. Additionally, not all membranes are the same. Some are more effective for short-chain versus long-chain PFAS, so care needs to be taken in selecting and designing systems. Reverse osmosis may be suitable for low-flow systems such as residential point-of-entry or point-of-view systems, but the user should be aware that the system removes almost everything, including hardness, alkalinity, or other beneficial constituents, which may need to be replaced in some drinking water applications. Now that we've covered the field demonstrated water technologies, we'll discuss some limited application technologies for liquids. The first one is in situ sorption. In this case, colloidal activated carbon is injected into the aquifer to create a permeable sorptive barrier to contain a plume, similar to a pump and treat containment. This approach could be applicable along a property line or to protect a drinking water well or a surface water body. The technology has been widely demonstrated for VOCs, but limited to a handful of field sites for PFAS. This case study shown in the figure reflects four years of post-injection data on the right, and all the wells in the injection area are still less than 20 nanograms per liter. Because sorption is finite, like any carbon product, this approach has the same ultimate breakthrough issues as ex situ carbon but additional injections could be performed later if the sorption capacity of the carbon is reached. Several US DOD funded projects are looking at field pilot testing of non-proprietary liquid sequestering agents with and without carbon. As discussed in the FATE and Transport module, many PFAS concentrate at air-water interfaces and high concentrations have been observed in PFAS foams that form on contaminated water bodies. Foam fractionation takes advantage of this behavior. It can be applied with ozone, as in ozofractionative catalyzed reagent addition, or OCRA, or using air, as applied by other practitioners. This technology has been field applied at full scale at a limited number of sites, mostly in Australia and Tasmania. Air or ozone is bubbled up through columns to carry the PFAS into the foam fraction at the top that spills out. Sequential columns further concentrate the PFAS into the foam. The, these okra example results on the right demonstrate 99.9% .9 reduction in concentration in the waste liquid stream with no secondary or polishing treatment. The resulting foam concentrate represents a much smaller volume of material, which then requires further treatment, incineration, or disposal. In some cases, an ion exchange, carbon, or RO polish is used to get to non-detect and address short-chain PFAS, which are less susceptible to fractionation. Now we'll quickly review a few developing liquid treatment technologies, 
those that have not been field tested but have been demonstrated in research labs on the bench scale. Although some may have reached the field stage by now under research programs such as the USDOD's program. Some of these technologies would be most applicable to low flow, high concentration liquids such as regenerable resin wastewater, condensate from thermal processes, or a polish step on a leachate treatment train, as opposed to treating dilute groundwater from a pump and treat system. Electrochemical oxidation is where electrical energy is introduced into a liquid to break the carbon fluorine bonds on PFAS. The graph on the right shows greater than 95% destruction of PFOA and PFOS in several hours time. Not all electrodes are effective and very few commercially available electrodes have been tested with PFAS. Some PFAS precursors will be transformed to more recalcitrant end products. However, this precursor transformation will occur with most, if not all, destructive methods. Electrochemical oxidation also oxidizes everything else in the water. So energy usage and effectiveness are affected by co-contaminants or dissolved organic carbon in the liquids. Aggressive chemical oxidation and reduction, otherwise known as redox, is an area of intense research now, but thus far all applications seem to have significant limitations as they require extreme conditions and do not destroy all PFAS to innocuous end products, but generally transform PFAS precursors or long chain PFAS into shorter chain PFAS. Activated persulfate oxidation has been demonstrated to be effective, but only at high temperatures in the 40 to 85 C range and at pH less than three. And it is more effective on carboxylates than sulfonates. This higher temperature requirement is energy intensive and limits field applications. Zero valent metals, which are effective reductants for many other organic compounds, have been tested for PFAS with some success. Nanoscale zerovalent iron and zerovalent zinc are two that have been looked at which show some promise. Ultraviolet light combined with sulfite creates hydrated electrons, which are strong reducing agents, as well as various oxidizing radicals. The graphs show the mass to charge ratio on the y-axis versus retention time on the x-axis, which defines each dot as a specific PFAS compound, and the size of the dot is the concentration. The graphs do show destruction of many PFAS, not just transforming one PFAS to another. An additional approach to generating both strong radicals and oxidants is non-thermal plasma. In this approach, argon is bubbled up through the water, causing PFAS to concentrate at the liquid surface where an overlying electrical discharge creates radicals and other reactive species in a shallow layer. A field pilot test of this technology is just starting under USDOD funding. Electron beam or E-beam redox has been tested for PFAS. This technology uses electron accelerators to generate solvated electrons and hydrogen radicals, which are strong reducing species, as well as hydroxyl radicals, which are strong oxidizing species. This creates both advanced oxidation and reduction processes without the addition of any chemicals. The last destructive liquid technology we'll cover is synolysis. Acoustic energy creates cavitation in a liquid causing bubbles. When those bubbles collapse, intense pressures and temperatures result. Fortuitously, PFAS accumulate at the surface of those bubbles and are therefore destroyed in those localized energy intensive environments. As shown on the graph at right, like most oxidative methods, PFOA is more easily destroyed than PFOS. Synolysis has been demonstrated for destruction of AFFF under a USDOD research grant, but may also be applicable to other high concentration, low flow applications. Another potential application is shown in the lower left, where water is pumped through a well with a sonolytic reactor in the well to destroy the PFAS as they flow through. This design is conceptual at present. The last group of developing technologies are alternative sorbents. Materials that have been tested with some success are biochar, which is essentially a low grade carbon product that is inexpensive to produce, and it has shown some PFAS sorption capability. Zeolites or clay minerals, where cationic clays attract the anionic functional group of PFAS. Surface modification can be used to enhance that sorption. Mixtures of carbon and clay, which are proprietary blends that capitalize on carbon sorption and anion attraction to cationic clay materials. And polymer coated sand, where the coating is the sorptive material, and it can be regenerated easily by flushing with more of the polymer. Now we'll discuss soil remediation technologies, both well-developed and those with limited applications. Well-demonstrated technologies for soil are limited to excavation and off-site disposal or incineration. 
Landfilling could be considered, although transferring potential liability to another location is often not preferred. When considering landfilling, check with the landfill or disposer first. Not all disposal locations will take PFAS contaminated soil, even though in most states it is still considered non-hazardous. Excavation and off-site incineration is generally considered the only destructive approach for PFAS in soils. Of course, incineration is expensive and a very high energy approach. Additionally, the US EPA and other regulatory agencies have questioned whether the data exists to prove that PFAS are fully mineralized versus being transferred to atmospheric emissions. Further data collection is critical to answer this question. One thing to note is the US EPA is considering designating PFOS and PFOA as hazardous substances under CERCLA. This could affect incineration and disposal options. Excavation and stabilization to reduce leachability through sorption is also a field demonstrated technology. Fixation by conventional soil stabilization chemicals such as Portland cement is not very effective for PFAS. Therefore, proprietary blends of carbon, minerals, and clays have been developed and demonstrated at sites in Australia and Europe. The field demonstrations have been dominantly using an Australian product, which includes aluminum hydroxide, which promotes electrostatic interactions, powdered activated carbon for sorption through hydrophobic interactions and weak van der Waals forces, and kaolin clay for physical binding. The resulting material has a large surface area combined with mixed molecular surface charges to bind PFAS efficiently at mixtures in the 1 to 5 percent range. Soil washing is a limited application technology at present, having been field pilot tested but not full scale implemented yet. The, the approach separates the fines, which are clays and organic materials, from the coarser fraction of the soil. In typical soils, the PFAS would be primarily sorbed to those fines which represent a considerable volume reduction in terms of what would require any further treatment, such as incineration or disposal. Liquid waste and settled sludge from the process also require further treatment. If the soils are clay rich, the system is slower and more costly than coarser grain soils. Dry sieving may be an option for some situations, uh, slightly less effective than soil washing, but simpler and may be less expensive. There is a full-scale soil washing plant being constructed in Australia right now, in anticipation of treatment needs for soil stockpiled by Australian Defense and others. Thermal desorption, which has been demonstrated in several bench tests and a handful of field pilots, is considered a developing technology. Rather than PFAS destruction, such as with incineration, the goal here is to drive the PFAS off the soil without actually breaking up the PFAS molecules. Mineralizing PFAS creates free fluorine, which can combine with water vapor to form hydrofluoric acid. Hydrofluoric acid is detrimental to the machinery and requires more sophisticated off-gas treatment approaches. Low to moderate temperature thermal desorption avoids this challenge. This approach is a slow cooking method where low temperatures in the range of 350 to 400 C are held for longer durations such as days to weeks. This has been demonstrated in bench testing as shown on the table as well as one field scale pilot funded by the USDOD. This low temperature ex situ approach could be applied in a hot box or in soil piles. These temperatures may also be achievable in situ. Gases generated from the heating could be treated with vapor phase carbon, which is then sent off site for reactivation or with thermal oxidation. Overall treatment technology takeaways are as follows. Although there are only a few well-developed technologies for PFAS treatment, what is commercially available can be sufficient for many sites. For liquids, pump and treat with carbon, reverse osmosis, or ion exchange are well demonstrated options, although all are relatively high in operation and maintenance costs and do not address source areas, thus requiring long-term operations. For soil, dig and haul to an incinerator is the only destructive solution to eliminate liability. Landfilling maintains potential liability in a different location. Sorption stabilization reduces leaching and potential contribution to groundwater or surface water, but does not eliminate liability because the PFAS are not destroyed. Limited application technologies include several options that have been shown to be effective in field testing but have minimal documented full-scale applications. For liquids, injectable sorbents of various types are the only in situ solutions potentially available. Foam fractionation has been applied successfully at several sites, but it is not well documented in peer-reviewed literature. For soil, soil washing pro shows promise, although managing multiple waste streams may be a challenge. Developing technologies include, for liquids, aggressive redox processes via a number of mechanisms do show promise. 
although so far none have been demonstrated at field scale, so questions remain about both effectiveness and economics of the various approaches. Alternative sorbents are being evaluated but need to prove they are cost effective when compared to carbon and ion exchange resins, which are widely applied. For soils, thermal desorption is an ultimately destructive option with the potential of being much less expensive than incineration. It is likely that treatment trains will end up being the most cost effective, capitalizing on the strengths of each approach and avoiding their limitations. Regardless, for the foreseeable future, treatability testing and field scale pilot testing will be required to carry out full scale remedy selection and engineering design. On behalf of ITRC, thank you so much for attending this discussion of PFAS treatment technologies. As you can see, the complexity of PFAS make treatment a challenge for environmental professionals and the best way to address it is with the most accurate information. It is the goal of ITRC to provide that information to support industry efforts at managing this difficult group of contaminants. Please follow us on social media and visit the ITRC PFAS webpage for additional videos, fact sheets, and guidance documents for PFAS and other key environmental issues.